All right, we're rolling. Well, hey, man, how are you? Can't complain. I'm still breathing. Woke up this morning. <laughs> oh, how did that move? The what? So how about yourself? Oh, man. If I was to compress this last week into a fortune cookie, it would read, tread lightly, but continue treading. Mm. Um, when I was 22, it felt like I was treading water. But this last week, man, I've been walking slash running over hot coals. Um, and it's partly because I've been so non-indecisive this week. I've been forced into this track of penultimate decision, penultimate decision, really important decision. This has gravity. This has weight. This affects X. This affects Y. This affects Z. And because they come so frequently, I don't have time to really, really weigh options. I just have to go into like a pre-internet, pre-calculated state of what does the Holy Spirit say? And I don't mean to be all spiritual with that. No, that's, yeah. That's um, the, but, the pra practical side of it. Yeah, dude. It, it ended well, though. I got what I needed. I just lost my job because uh, the restaurant I worked at went underwater. They had been, oh. I, you know, they've been that underwater for. Yeah, it does. They had been underwater for 13 years, and I didn't know I was blowing bubbles out with them. I thought I was just climbing the corporate ladder. I like Which that. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not so. Long story short, um, the next day after my last day, I got a new job in a new city and found a house in four days. You know. God. Um, so I'm moving Jan first. Really? Word. Yeah. We're, uh, is that uh, close by or good size oh, move? Or? It's, a, it's a good size. Um, psychologically, it's the biggest move I've ever made. I'm going to the, Oak, the Bay. Word. Yeah. But it's only geographically four hours from where I reside. So it's not a big deal. Okay. Word. Are you... When I was in South Dakota, it was a drive from Pierre, South Dakota, Sioux Falls, basically. Word. You've been, uh, you've been down in SoCal, right? Yeah, I, I live in Grover Beach Grover right now, Beach. which is, I think okay. it's technically Southern California. Word. You're up north, right? Washington? Uh, Southern Oregon. Um, mm. I was in Washington for a bit, like a month and a half. Uh, yeah, back down. For now, I'm back down. Um, Southern Oregon. And then... Uh, January, we'll see, they haven't sent me my ticket yet. January like 7th or something, um, I'm uh, hitting the road and going to work on a music tour again. Um, so I'll be traveling around the country for three months. So yeah, that'll be- Nice, man. Yeah. Is this your, your rap, your music? No, your no, 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 definitely not. No, I, uh, I work for an um, independent contractor for a, uh, a Holt International Children's Services, um, like an international adoption agency. Um, and so they're the main sponsor for the tour, uh, Winter Jam, Winter Jam Tour, Tour Spectacular or whatever, uh, Christian music tour. Um, but uh, yeah, we're the, the main sponsor. And so um, we try to get kids uh, taken care of and, and monthly sponsorships um, and then giving out a, information to uh, people who are interested in adoption and trying to get that worked out. Um, yeah, it's a pretty cool opportunity to travel and be around that music scene to learn as much as I can and do ministry at the same time. So yeah. I'm excited. It's my last year doing it probably. My third third year. Didn't do it last year, but uh yeah. I haven't had life stuff going. Um so I've had the opportunity to do it, but now I'm trying to get some stuff kicked off and so hopefully I will be able to build a life that I can't uh I can't just leave for three months, you know. That's good. That's the goal. That uh, reminds me of the movie Heat with Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. I don't know if you ever saw it. Not yet. Yeah, it's a great it. movie. 
There's a, you own it? Yeah, I just haven't gotten to it yet. There's a to. moment where De Niro, who plays a, a efficient gangster, he's like a postmodern gangster. And he's very much the, the alpha in the wolf pack. Hmm. And of course, along the way, he meets a beautiful woman who steals his heart and causes him to consider in the you know, middle career Robert De Niro way. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Maybe I'll uh, put some roots down. So he goes into her swanky house. I think it's in LA. It's full of glass. It's very postmodern architecture. Blue lighting everywhere because Michael Mann likes his blue mood. He does. He's a visual poet. And they sit down, and this is the point. She asks him, because he lies, he doesn't say that he's an actual gangster. He's, you know, this kind of like traveling consultant. <laughs> he doesn't have an AK-47 in his car. He's, you know, he's, he's, a, <laughs> he's a cognitive economist in some yeah. sense. So he's, he's, you know, BSing about what he does for a living. And then she's like, well, what, what about us? And, you know, how could you ever adapt yourself to moving so often as a consultant? And he says, that's the discipline. Something, if you are not willing to leave everything you have and turn around the corner in 30 seconds or less, this life isn't cut out for you. And she says, but how could you do that? And he says, that's the, and as he's looking at her, and you can tell he's looking through her to what he could be doing and then stopping and retreating back into her. And he says, that's the discipline. And it's the great ambiguity of the scene. And then finally, in the end, when he's being chased by Al Pacino, he could get away, but he stops to say goodbye to her one last time. And it takes 55 seconds. Mm. And those extra 15 cost him his life. Why did I say all that? I don't know. I just think it's very interesting when you, especially bringing out that topic you raised of having things we're not inclined to leave. It's really powerful. Yeah. Yeah, no, that. You have to check out that movie. Tell me what you think. Yeah, I, uh, es the, especially the way it's filmed, the way it was filmed, um, is super intriguing to me uh, from like the directorial side of things. Um, like using blanks, uh, actual re recording, actual sound of that uh scene of that firefight scene um instead of just doing foley stuff you know later on different things like that and then the structure of of the action um has always been something that people recommend studying so yeah i got the dvd old school with it the reason that i haven't seen it yet is because i don't have a dvd player <laughs> but uh yeah i definitely need to cut out some time to watch that. So I, I watched your video um, concerning Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. And I was really fascinated <laughs> by, I was fascinated by it all. In fact, I spent a good chunk of this morning uh, looking at some lore of Star Wars. Mm. You, you raised, you deepened my intrigue about the canonized backstories of these people, yeah. especially Darth Vader immediately after waking up in his suit. Mm. and the clone who uh hawk do you remember hawk is he the one that uh did hawk try to befriend vader yes that yeah. i'd love to see that on film so and then your script and something i wanted to end point together discuss because i'd love your opinion on it um, um or opinions the light in the dark binary it's a dualism but underneath that we have other dualisms that are more nuanced in character right the, the feminine the masculine and the other things that you had said in your conversation and uh those deeper adult levels and then with your character who somehow embodies both and this force being a kind of i'm gonna use like a ten dollar word that i actually don't know what it means but it's trying to get out what i'm trying to say like this hypostatic thing where okay. it's not one-sided but it's not two-sided in like a cliche sort of i'm all things to all men but it's 
And it's not stoic, it's not indifferent to the choice, yeah. but it somehow rises above while being profoundly below the choice and you never know how it's going to turn out until the character acts. And I suppose that would be thrilling to see as an image in motion. And then your testimony, I'm sure is thrilling to see in motion. Like, have you ever thought of bringing these things together in memoir? I, I look out at the world and I see artists turning to memoir for some reason. What's, um, your, what's your take on that? The autobiographical, the self-expressive, et cetera? Yeah, I, I guess that's kind of what I'm going for a bit of with like, I don't know, I felt with this Discord, um, you know, I don't have, uh, I don't have value to add in a lot of different areas. Um, but what I do have to, to offer up, I guess, is um, some stories. And so um, that's kind of why I've leaned into to telling a bunch of different stories. Um, and so I guess in, the, in a way that's kind of what you're talking about is what I'm, you know, attempting to do a little bit, but uh, uh, something I've sent you before, I think is a, a bit of memoir-ish. I mean, it's a little strange. It's a little, uh, I don't know, it doesn't really have a genre, which is kind of a problem if I do publish. I don't really have a place to put it to market it but uh yeah i think i think people's stories are powerful and um they cut through a lot of stuff and they yeah and it's a similar thing to testimony of like you can't argue with someone's testimony like it happened i don't you know I don't know what to tell you. This is what happened to me, you know? Um, so it doesn't linger kind of what, what me and Andrew were talking about with like poetry of, you know, how it, it goes here first before it comes back to the head where most things we, we try to figure it out and then it, we allow it down into our heart to affect us deeper, but uh, stories and, you know, poetry and whatnot um, just has a way of just really affecting us. Uh, yeah, we, we open up the, the fortress gates or something like that when it's a narrative or it's a something like that. We either don't suspect it to affect us deeply or we, I don't know, something, something about it just allows us to be vulnerable and, and not overanalyze. And, and, um, so I'd, I'd say that, uh, I think memoir is, uh, it's definitely rising. It's definitely growing um, with, with our generation. With stuff that I've written and shown to some of my buddies, they're like, oh man, I've, I've, I've been thinking about doing something kind of like this. Um, so maybe I should get to that. Like multiple people have said that. So I, I don't know what it is. I guess a lot of social media causes self-reflection. And so maybe um, people are like, huh, maybe I should put this on wax. Maybe it could do something. I don't know. Maybe half the people are like, maybe it could help people. And then the other half are like, maybe it could help me. Like it could, uh, you know, this could be my ticket to fame or whatever. And then there's other people who are like, no, I, that's the purpose of stories. And the purpose of my life is to be a, a an example and a learn your lessons from me kind of thing so you don't have to make my mistakes um yeah yeah i really like that and i'm seeing it too uh on the ground where i am uh, grover beach there's a nice coffee shop called red bee and over the I'm, i've been here for two years and over the last two years through the grapevine, what I mean by that is a couple community colleges and uh, Southern Cal, or Cal Poly, 
I've befriended some people who are artists, but they're just young men and they, they, they can't help but integrate their own life issues. And I don't mean that mm. with a negative spin, but maybe a better phrase is we all have problems like a Jordan, Jordan B. Peterson thing. Life is suffering. Um, we confront, which means we confront objectively problems to solve all the time. De decision trees, left and right. Um, we're not alone. We're in maybe communities too highfalutin a word, but we're surrounded by others in a nexus of all these decision trees. And first thing is, do we see the same tree? Mm. Does the decision tree affect us equally? Um, and then three, am I a good enough person to care about externalities <laughs> when I make my decisions? All those things are subtly negotiated when we sit down and talk about the bills or talk about a job or talk about anything we talk about, right? It's always like underneath that. Yeah. And some people are more willing to expose and other people are more willing to mm, cast in a different light so that it sounds like we're talking about something other than we're talking about. And of course it's a spectrum, but I just noticed they're using their art. So one person's in sound design, another person's in graphic design, another person wants to be a writer for film. Equally, they bring whatever problem they have to bear. Where am I going to live? What am I going to do? Why do I want to be in this job when it has nothing directly relating or overlapping with my dream? And they make that their character or their hero's journey. But then they complicate it with, but I'm supposed to be this kind of artist in this kind of genre. And so almost all of our conversations, say, at the beach or wherever we happen to be is, are we post-genre or am I just not you know, haven't put in my 10,000 hours yet to understand the genre. Mm. And, you know, what does that say? That kind of conversation say on a meta level about where we are. So that's how I relate to what you said. I think it's happening in a lot of different places. That's super interesting. Something, uh, thought project, uh, Charlie had said was, uh, had, Kind of asked me was like what uh, in general on the Discord um, was like what so we're talking about story. He said something about like everyone lives within a narrative. Um, that's why narrative is so powerful. But you have to figure out what your narrative is. Um, and he was like, "What is what is your narrative? Like your life narrative? You know." And yeah, when, when I hear that question, I hear, I guess from a writer perspective, I hear like, what is your genre? What is your, you know, yeah, that. And then as an artist as well, there's a, uh, maybe there's like a propensity to um, want to decide what that is or to, be in control of that and to be an artist in that instead of which there's there's definitely some fruit to that um and it's just something that artists or creatives are just naturally going to do but yeah there's surrender to the path is a very important thing um or just like the humility to, to understand, like, I don't know what, <laughs> what's going on with my life. Like I have, I'm, I'm fairly self-aware. And so, you know, I have my theories and whatnot, but they're just theories, especially at this point. Uh, so yeah, you, I feel like you just kind of have to be open to, you know, being led by the guide what the helmsman do, what the helmsman will do. So I like that. So there are three levels I'm, I'm hearing in what you're saying. Perhaps we can explore together. The first is the content proper. Your Star Wars script, my novel, Great Migrations. Um, and then all the spinoffs from that, like you said, you, you have a universe within of uh, potential writing. Um, 
And likewise, second level, there's the now how do I define myself in relation to this product and this um, source of production? The auteur question, or however it's pronounced. <laughs> and then third level, what is that organizing principle beyond which there is nothing and before which all things are led, myself included, and my ability to generate product included? What's, what's my absolute relation to that talos? And I don't mean to sound pedantic with all these words. They just generate in me stimulation, so that's why I use them. Yeah, no, that's talked a little bit about that with Verveki. It's those that that kind of stuff is helpful. It condenses a bunch of different stuff into a, a word. If you understand that word, then you get all that other stuff. I guess the problem is just with not understanding the language. But and I'm the sort of person where I never think about what I'm going to say next. I mm -hmm. feel out like a syncopated musician, what's coming next. And I'm trying to feed off what we're doing together and engaged with. So what is the absolute relation to the Talos that cuts through from level one content, level two, the ego's relation to the content, and then finally the ultimate concern of that Talos is I mean, there, there are so many formulations, right? There's the Christian of the Jesus Christ, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I really like, I mean, no matter how you construe it, for me, an individual finds themselves in this three-part paradigm. If they're laying brick or if they're writing Star Wars or Great Migrations, it's the same. You're, you, you make a thing. You're relating yourself to the thing constantly. That's the psychological level. And then theologically, metaphysically, however you want to phrase it, you're relating your relation to an absolute relation that constrains it in its possibility. Um, the guide. Um, now, I think in those three levels, Peugeot becomes important to me. Okay. Because he tries to talk poetically of how to see. I see what you're saying. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So maybe you take that in some direction. I'm curious. Yeah, that. With so with just with like um, with you're asking like how do you utilize all three to operate basically um because like you had said the the being the example to another being the exemplar of a virtue or set of virtues requires a kind of representation of a philosophy not like a list of do's and don'ts but this is how i see this is what i see and this is why i don't see other things Mm. in phenomena so someone who i won't say integrated because that i don't think that sounds right but someone who's able to traverse one two and three back again without losing their mind can represent that movement in the slight subtleties of what they say on a given day and when they network with people across time and space the ease in which they make those movements just naturally radiate and reflect on how they adjust the camera lens, how they make a decision on budget, when they write their novel and where, and how they tell the story of where they wrote the novel and why it was so important to do it in a small room with a two shelf bookshelf <laughs> in the bay, right? Like these things become not marketing techniques, but symbolically bridgeable from level one to level two, and then to the level three, that makes personal testimony something of iconography, right? Something that speaks on multiple levels at once and can therefore be um, unpackaged at will and at leisure. And it's horribly pretentious unless it's true. Hmm. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah, I. One more thing. I've noticed on the Discord a number of people 
like when they when they talk about Peugeot, they say he's abstract and tiresome in his in his manner. But then naturally, after a period of time, he'll say a thing that will connect everything he said before. Mm. It will come as a truth bomb. And they'll say, yeah. "Okay, now I'm in love with him again." Yeah. And I find that interesting, not because of Peugeot or of his rhetorical techniques, but as a example of the movement when one can go from one, two, and three back again and then speak from that place of perspective and how that act of speaking it represents the movement itself. And when someone responds to that level of speaking, it's almost as if they're vicariously making the movement. And maybe part of making the movement is at first it seems abstract and why am I doing this? It's a waste of time. And then, oh, now I see how all the pieces click. And there's a return. That's been my experience with them is <laughs> at different points. Like, I don't know, man. I don't know if I'm uh, different stuff. I'm on super love and, and it just, of course. Other things have been like, yeah, you're, you're out there, man. It's, this isn't it. And then <laughs> like a couple videos later, um, the interesting thing is, is, yeah, just how other things all play into it. So, like, being in this Discord, um, you know, there's that relationship of, like, me watching Pajot's videos or whatever. And what I would get, the, the process that I would go through normally. But then you add in all of this other opinion and discipleship and whatnot and that helps lead to that realization as well that oh now it all makes sense it's so it's not just this personal thing it's this uh you know corporate kind of thing as well as everyone's doing this it's like linked and and hmm yeah, that's, that's an interesting, uh, that's super interesting with how it, how it, how community, the blend of community and, and personal journey, you know, like there's all this stuff that needs to happen for me. Like I need to do, I need to go through those steps. I need to be putting in the, the work to, to make it through that. But I don't know if a person can just alone go through this stuff. Um, you kind of need everyone going through this stuff all the way around, putting in their inputs and stuff. And then that is what gets us over our hurdles or our roadblocks or reveals the door in the dead end or whatever. Um, That reminds me of what Peterson said at one point, that maybe the university is not on campus anymore. Hmm. Maybe the university has been outsourced to an invisible highway that is infinite in scope. Um, and I don't mean to make an absolutist claim, but what you just said reminded me of this attempt at coherence where we try to get everyone on board, not in a totalitarian, we'll beat you over the head if you don't assent, but this is what's emerging. Consensus is emerging around some set of um, perspectives, if not subjects, and uh, ways of seeing, if not ways of being. And then you add to that the dynamic that everyone's in different places with their own instantiated groups of friends and family members and work relationships, and they indirectly bring out the fruit of those discourses, those private thinkings. And like when I think privately, I am bringing the discord between my ears. Like you said, like certain people have become my Senate and my house. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. And certain people have that mallet or whatever it's called, the hammer, that when they say, I'm like, like as I'm thinking, they become the dialectical partner of no. I'm like, no. Something, <laughs> you know. And they don't know that. In yeah. fact, if I told them, it would probably be 
inappropriate because it wasn't in their intention. So you, yeah. we get all these like little avatars and agents without any intentional ties. And who knows how long they'll last. They may be like um, uh, fireflies in the night. They're supposed to guide us so far and then, yeah. and then they'll return because they weren't actually substantial. Like the people themselves are substantial, but the impression they leave is, um, it's so interesting. It's like we, we could compress five different travels or journeys into two or three hours with the right set of people online in a conversation, right? It's not the same thing. I'm not trying to make them equivalent, but I'm just riffing from what you had said. So then let me ask you this. How does one use that without using it? This is my personal question. How does one use that without using it, right? Making it a, a utility, making it a thing to just be sucked dry of value, but a thing to contribute as well as receive, a thing to be taken and held lightly because it is full of people, not products. And I'll cite an example. I know early on, someone had mentioned, there's this thing that happens on the Discord where when someone new comes, everybody like flocks to the new because they have a new mm. perspective. There's novelty there. And then after a week or two of being on the voice channel or you know, posting some things, people feel as if they have that person pegged. And so they're part of us, but once the novelty comes back, we know where to go. I think that's not happening anymore because we've had the time to set up like nice wine bottles of classics and vintage. But it's still my question remains, how do we use this without using it? And how do we, because we're dealing with people and not products. Yeah. It also reminds me of how, and you kind of touched on it, but how like when you voice something, it really brings about the potential to tarnish it. You know, when you, uh, when you bring something to light, uh, an observation more so, um, like with your, your Senate and your, you know, like if you were to voice that, like not only would it maybe not be inappropriate, it also might probably would limit it in some way it would it would you know um break it a little bit so that's an interesting side of that but i don't i think um i would say that the the key to that kind of stuff is is operating in love and understanding what love is and what it looks like um kind of with like uh you know Kant's um the end doesn't justify the means um so just never crossing on on that um yeah i mean that's basically your question is like how do we how do we operate in a way that doesn't turn people into means um how do we treat people as ends not as, you know, carriers of intellectual freight. And once we unload the freight, we no longer need the conveyor belt known as a person. Send them on down the line. Yeah. Send them on down the line. <laughs> we got other conversations to have. Yeah. You know, and in one sense, there's freedom mm -hmm. in letting people go. But in another sense, there's a way to let go and a way not to let go. Yeah. And that, that there's a self-awareness that comes with that, that I don't think we yet have a language for. Or maybe we did, but we lost it. Hmm. Like, I don't think I could go and watch a movie made in the 90s and have that language of self-awareness to show me how to let go, but not let go in the wrong way. <laughs> and of, of X, Y, and Z, right? Because like Ecclesiastes, everything a time and its season. Every idea, a time and its season. Like, yeah. I love Soren Kierkegaard. Um, I love what he stood for. I love what he represented. And when I mean that, I mean the one, two, three and how he made the movements in his own life. I read his biography, read his works. I, I collated the two. I like, I did my Orthodox thing and prayed to him as a saint. I felt like, you know, there was some back and forth there, but I don't want to go too deep into that because I could sound crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But in a Peugeot sense, the symbols and signs were there and there was a definite leading. And then, you know, David Bentley Hart came into my life from Notre Dame. And I he saw talks that you about, had said that. Yes. And he's talking, <laughs> he's talking about universal salvation, not from this is what I've thought up perspective, but this is what the church father, St. Gregory of, um, I don't know where, said in like the fourth century. And so now I'm being surrounded by church fathers and I'm praying to them, especially St. John Chrysostom. Um, because the church I go to, there's a lady named Athena. Athena, she might become my godmother. I don't know. She, uh, I'm leaving in a week and a half, so I doubt it. But I think I'll still be in contact with her. She recommended St. John Chrysostom because everyone gets their own saint. And it's supposed to be someone that you think is walking with you on the path. And I thought it was Kierkegaard. Now, he's not an mm. official saint, but I thought I'd make him one. But something about Chrysostom and then David Bentley Hart talking, they talked in such a way that made the existential burden of carrying faith on your shoulders less of a burden and much more about what emerges as faith in dialogue with the community and also in responses made to the community it's like why yeah yeah so then kierkegaard's idea of just the thing to focus on in the christian life as the example of what a christian life is in its essence is that three-day walk of abraham alone where he couldn't communicate with his son he couldn't communicate with his wife he was just in his head thinking through the deepest possible interpretation of these classical words that only he in the moment of raising the knife could possibly comprehend. Like I thought that was it for like six years. And then David Bentley Hart, not in any one word, but just in how he interpreted things. I said to myself, maybe one of the reasons Abraham is so important is he woke up early in the morning and left home. And then he returned home while having this adventure. So what is the thing that's actually making those three days so significant? It's the contrast of that moment from the normal, hmm. the home, the community, the hearth. And yes, he was a man given to tents and traveling as a foreigner and all these things, but who'd he travel with? The steady family, the yeah. people who were on the same page. It wasn't a lone wolf, rugged individual, Emersonian type going on that Western frontier of come what may. Like even the prophets, right? I'm almost done. They were given to concerns of the city. I thought of this line as I was driving to Oakland in the middle of the night. And it reminded me of Bottle Air or Boudet. I don't know how to say it. Anyway, the city, my mistress. Like there's something about those prophets in the city, about the collectivity, about more than oneself that allows them to have such a self-reliance, ironically. And it's action and depth understood in that frame, which makes me think Kierkegaard was a sign and a milestone and he's always with me, but I think he's pointing me beyond him to other saints because he's with those saints now and they're with him and they found peace in that love that you talked about. And so I can't help but think, man, we are taught by the dead just as well as the living. There's a university in discord, but also in the great traditions. And those things operate, they actually operate. They're not like abstractions. Mm. Uh, so that was a lot of words. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, with, I mean, with the uh, veneration of saints and all that, I, um, that's not something that I've received clarity on. Um, but I'm not like, you know, or any, you know, super opposed or anything like that. But, uh, but I still, no, I, I still, I still, I hear what you're saying and I still see the fruit of such things. Um, and maybe all of that was to say some kind of, or make some kind of observation about admiration and its behavior patterns. Um, maybe. Um, Because, I mean, there are writers I admire, there are musicians I admire, there are people I admire for their virtues, 
Um, there are people I admire for their risk-taking proclivities. You know, there are a number of reasons I admire different people. I do think admiration is a fundamental basis of human interaction. Well, I mean, that's, that's love. It, it's do you seeing, think so? It, well, it's seeing the, uh, the, the value of someone. You know, it's seeing the, uh, either the value, the expressed value, um, or the potential, you know, um, it's, I don't know, in my opinion, that's more of a God lens than, uh, than other, other ways of looking at it. I definitely think that that's the way that, that, yeah, everyone has, everyone has at least something to, to champion and to, uh, glean. Um, isn't there some that it's, it's in our uniqueness in our complete uniqueness, there's still kindredness. And so there's the, uh, you know, there's just the, uh, uh, if, if you're, that's the point of like self-awareness um, in some way is to, to see, okay, that's like me or that, you know, I could see how I could, I could think that. And so how does that, how does that shape what I believe? Should I be believing that? Should I, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Yeah, that, I don't know. I think most of the worth, most of what is to be learned is from that kind of stuff. It's from noticing that tiny little detail of someone, um, some, some way that they're amazing and, and seeing uh, the beauty in it and the, how that's a, a, little piece of the intended creation you know um and we all got these small kind pieces to to kind of arrange but then there's that whole i don't know there's not that whole but uh then you have to you have to have a framing to arrange them um and you have to have a correct framing some frames are dangerous and some, but I don't know. This is getting a little. No, keep going, man. Keep going. Elaborate. I just see how. With, yeah, just with, uh, I guess without the framing that I have, I wouldn't come to the conclusion of what I've just stated. So I don't know. But yeah, that, that is a lot of what I would call, you know, agape love. Um, but you have to frame it correctly for it to be agape love or else it's a, uh, self-serving thing um you know you're just seeing oh there's a lesson oh they're a lesson for me oh they're a i can i can pimp that little thing in myself and that'll be profitable for me um it's, it's easy to and it's easy to deceive yourself of like really doing that what i just said but but lying to yourself and saying like oh no i'm i'm valuing them i am seeing the beauty in them like no you're just seeing how or i'm just seeing how they're of worth to me you know how i can use them um utilize them yeah correct framing Wow. 
so I'm like, this is getting deep. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why our mortality has been staged. Hmm. We will shuffle off this mortal coil because it allows us to self-reflect on our self-awareness's limit and therefore the utility that we can spend in others has its direct proportional resource in ourselves that time and time again implanted in our consciousness echoes that our lifespan is limited and not preserved hmm. and so we can't help but project mortality onto every single experience of others and of the potential of others and yes that's ecclesiastes writ large but um if we didn't have it the havoc we would wreak because then when you when i say let's say um an agape situation i love the person but had no implantation of mortality in the relationship I don't even have words for the kind of ruin without cease I could bring and that person could bring, right? Yeah. Imagine immortals in our human frame. But then I ask, is that the end? Is that the talos of the third act? Cessation. So we have this awareness of immortality that we will shuffle off our mortal coil. Then it comes time to, at the end of the day, remove the robe and shuffle off the mortal coil. Take off the slippers, close the eyes after the door is shut, and then what? Third act. But it's an undiscovered country. Um, that's where so many of us put our faith and then we bring whatever we're currently playing with as in terms of the narrative of what happens after death to back into so this movement back into the relationships we naturally accumulate across time so it's yes this person just walked in two weeks ago i had this realization of what it is to be a soul and maybe not immediately I'm aware, but somehow I'm bringing that to what I mean by, that is a nice day. <laughs> when the person asks how my day is going, it's operated on these symbolic levels. Yeah. And wouldn't it be great if someone like in a character would just have this quirk where no matter what, to no matter what was asked, they completely answered in a articulated analysis of how those three levels operated. It would, hmm. I mean, that person would come across probably as unfriendable. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they'd be the ultimate friend. I don't know. I haven't seen that character ever depicted. They'd probably be the ultimate friend, but, but they'd be intolerable as well hmm. because of our, because of our, uh, the way we see things. And, um, I say that the, what we think stuff is supposed to be like what a, what is a friend supposed to be you know um, there's there's some level of like distortion of truth within this world and so um, we you know friendship it's it's a fallen version of it um, and so we I don't know Soren Kierkegaard used the phrase when he read Shakespeare. Um, he, Shakespeare meant a lot to Kierkegaard. He said that he found in Shakespeare's characters, and this is what qualified their timelessness for him, he found in their characters the resonance of the opposite. So when they said, I love you, he heard in that statement, because of Shakespeare's art, the resonance of, I hate you. And it wasn't like they neutralized one another. But there was always the resonance hmm. of the opposite. And it was that tuning fork idea, that musicality of resonance. Um, almost like the moment they said, 
I will live forever, immediately attune. That immediately attunes something far into the future, namely one's own most possibility of destruction, self-destruction, self-imploding. And I think he's right, even if he's even if he mischaracterized Shakespeare, I thought I think he made a philosophical point. Um, so, like you said, if we're in a fallen world, a friendship isn't a friendship because it has the resonance of the opposite. But it is a friendship, and so there's paradox. Like I've for the last for the last I don't know a while, as the leaves have fallen and fall, I've been thinking of the word paradox, and it has for me a kind of like a violet hue to it. I like the word. I don't want to overuse the word, but I like the word. My uh, mystery seems so blue and green and kind of like if I'm up on a mountain uh, boiling snow for water, I might say mystery. But paradox is like I'm on the city. I'm, I'm, at, I'm near some concrete. <laughs> I'm about to get on a train. I can say paradox and it will make multicolors and work for somebody. For me, I mean, not everything. It doesn't, it's not a complete... Uh... They're not, they're not fully symmetrical, but uh, I like to think of paradoxes as uh, juxtapositions. Um, it just kind of changes the frame of like, because paradox just implies impossibility. You can't figure this out. You know, it's, it's, that's kind of what it is speaking and when you hear the word paradox, it's kind of like a, an impossibility that somehow is. So you can't figure it out. To where, I don't know, it's semantics and maybe it's dumb, but with like no, man, this is like, for me, this is synesthesia. This is where the rubber meets the road. I listen to stuff. <laughs> word. Uh, with, with juxtaposition, it's like, it's a little more useful. It might still be that like impossible. Like if you really get down to it, it might still be impossible, but it's, it's more of a like somehow these two things, which are don't make sense together, operate in complete harmony. Um, so it's not an anomaly like paradox. It's, it's a, we don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of talking in circles, I guess. There's a slight, oh man, please, a like, slight complete difference. The couplet. Complete the couplet. <laughs> it, it's heroic at this juncture. <laughs> it's a, yeah, juxtaposition. It's a, I don't know. It's it's um, it allows for some level of reverse engineering, I guess, to some extent. Um, like you can, I, I feel like it allows a deeper dive into things, um, to where calling something a paradox, um, to me at least, uh, is a bit of a the end of the road like this is as far as we can get it's a paradox and so you know this is all we understand about it um and we just kind of have to come to terms with this like yes there's no matter what there's some element of that kind of thing with mystery like you just kind of have to surrender you know we don't get to know everything but also um i don't think we've necessarily reach the the root of things of everything that we think we have i don't think we've reached the dead ends i think we definitely have a lot of dead ends in this world in this fallen world um but i don't think we're there yet i also don't think that this world is as good as it can get even within its fallen state but that's a whole nother thing that might be heretical or whatever oh no i think <laughs> man i've, I've stopped uh, tracing the lines of heresies <laughs> i think I, I think the heresy is to call out heresies 
um, I'm reminded of some, some novelist, uh, I forgot his name, he wrote Cider House Rules. Mm. Anyway, he said one day when asked about Sigmund Freud and uh, Karl Barth and Abraham Maslow, he said, oh yeah, they're great. I mean, these are psychologists, sociologists, theologians. He said, yeah, they're great novelists. <laughs> he said, what's the difference between Sigmund Freud's essays and my book? Mm. <laughs> so one level of interpreting that, I agree with you, is to say, well, paradoxically, it's impossible to say how they're different or the same. So thinking stops here, which means the life can't be lived beyond that question. The most we can do is become Socrates, staring wide-eyed and dumbfounded at the mystery and receiving from God the praise of how humble we are that we know that we know nothing. But I really like what you said about juxtaposition. And here's the synchronicity. Man. Maybe a lot of artists are on the same wavelength as you. My buddy Ryan that I met down here in Grover, he's going to become a filmmaker. He's moving to L.A. in like five, six months. And he and I have been back and forth. He introduced the concept to me of juxtaposition. It's just like came out of him like honey. Like it's, it had just been building up in him, little parts of him, like bees had been working tirelessly on the wax and then juxtaposition. And he started explaining himself. Yeah, he started explaining himself relating to the other directors, you know, the Paul Thomas Andersons, the et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, I was coming from the novelist standpoint where I'm an individual. I am not influenced except by dead people. You know, the, the, the Robert. I have no Fitzgerald. contemporaries. I don't, yeah, I don't read my contemporaries. Um, they'll read me sort of thing. <laughs> you know, the necessary hubris of a struggling amateur. Um, yeah. The, but anyway, he said that and you said it. So I'm like, all right, there's something about image and film and juxtaposition as a concept that is golden, that has, has mileage to it. And so I really liked the positive spin you gave it in relation to the negativity of paradoxical relationships thank you yeah so that's uh from where i stand kind of how i see it i think they're movements so you we can go back and forth we can oscillate between the paradoxical interpretation of phenomena of things of each other and sometimes that's necessary because it's a great way to cut off our decept uh cut off ourselves from our deceptions hmm. self-deceptions mainly but then we need something positive to strive for in a good Petersonian sense to aim towards. And I think that's where juxtapositions give, a, give us hope. Word. And maybe that indirectly relates to my thing of mortality and immortality that, I mean, our hope is full of immortality, it says in the wisdom of Solomon. So maybe that's a juxtaposition of the end and the beginning as one movement. Um, wow, yeah, so my mind's racing after you articulated the juxtaposition. <laughs> It's a, it's a constant for me. A lot, I, I, a lot of what I write comes out to be this weird, like, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you, but uh, you... Uh, Like you have to grind patiently. You have to uh, pay attention and make haste. You know, like, um, and there's still a, a paradoxical element to that. You know, it's like, that doesn't, you know, they're very counter, so I don't, but there is a harmony of that. I guess that's what it is, is, is a harmony. Um, it's, it's creating a harmony of chaos without destroying the chaos. So in heat, in heat, maybe there's something to be said about the nature of true love, if I could use that cliche. Uh, maybe in the sense of Elita, Elitha, right? Whatever Reiki says about the fundamental nature of love as not not a not an emotional upheaval or revolution of the heart or expression of the mouth, but in fact a reality to be experienced between multiple users and interfaces interfaces of this thing called creation two that was a track but but um 
I'll find it. That movie Heat, maybe it's in the nature of true love for a commitment to be grounded in something like someone's willingness to walk away in 30 seconds or less and not. Hmm, yeah. Like the, it's one thing to give up, absolutely. I will never even contemplate, in other words, walking out in 30 seconds or less, which means I'll never have my suit uh, suitcase packed. It won't even arise in my mind. That's dead to me. Versus the suitcase is packed and I could catch the next train. And I always know the bus schedule. I always know. And I'm constantly making the movement of closure and staying put. I think there's something beautiful about that. So that. But it can also be interpreted as perverse and um, wrong, but it, I think it depends how we see. And that movie, tr that movie kills him in the end, but he does get to see her with that extra 15 seconds. He gets to see that object of, but you were about to say. Um, with my, with my walk with God, um, there's some level of like, uh, I don't know if it applies, but of like, like I, some, some level of like that 30 seconds, you know, like I could go, um, or I, I have my doubts and I explore my doubts. You know, I don't, I don't just say, okay, like I believe, so I'm not gonna lean into any doubts or no, like I still am a human who has a brain, you know, I'm still conscious and I'm free. And so a thought comes in and it must be dealt with. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's come to a point that like, yeah, mixing that with like Job, like no matter what you do to me, it, it doesn't matter. I'm staying because I don't have anywhere else to go. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, that's a different version of that love, though. Um, and it's just what popped into my head when you're saying that. Because, yeah, I think that's, that's when love becomes love is when there is that freedom to uh, bail or not, you know. Um, and maybe that's just love within a fallen state that, you know, we're always just going to have that like self-serving kind going on in the back of our head. But I don't know. A lot to unpack with love. I think we found the title of our video if we choose to publish this. A lot to unpack with love. <laughs> <laughs> There's a double sense of the word lot, a lot, mm. to unpack with love as a signature. <laughs> lot to unpack with love. <laughs> or juxtaposition and paradox. Yeah, that as well. I, man, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I did as well. This, I'm definitely, uh, even if we don't post it, I'm uh, going to be rewatching it multiple times too. Same. Uh, yeah, you you always give me a lot to think about and make me really, really engaged with stuff and really think about stuff. And I appreciate it big time. So well, I, I appreciate I appreciate you. You're a good dialogue partner. You you add layers to things and you do it in such a systematic way without being systematic that I'm going to review and rewatch what you say and how you say it. So thank you. Word. I mean, 
You're a good prose writer, man. Good prose writer. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I, I really recommend that you go for the long haul in terms of your paragraphs. You do it in your script, but in terms of your prose, you know, there are some writers that do short paragraphs. I think you can, you want to do both because it gives, it sets up the rhythm and flow, but uh, don't limit yourself with your paragraphs. In the 16th, 17th century, they had five page long paragraphs. So they, they had room to breathe and think, and you definitely can make some great long paragraphs. It, it's <laughs> easy to follow. And it adds everything to each layer. You do that when you explore the topic. And I'm just saying that as an appreciator of your style. I mean, you learn, you learn the lyricism from the rap and stuff like that, and that's great, but you, you really, you, you don't mind stretching it. So I, I enjoy that, and that's a compliment. Warren, I yeah. appreciate that. I'll have to think about that. And you know, they used to do a lot of subordinate clauses. But uh, I could see, and obviously do that too, but I could see you doing it in the Hemingway-esque style. Meaning? Of it, subject, verb, object. Not too many indirect objects. Doesn't mean the pair, it does not mean the sentences are simple, but it means they're direct. Mm. And, and they're, they're followable. And then one followable sentence leads to another followable sentence. I know that word wasn't pretty, but you followed me. And then it just goes deeper and higher and it can go around and it can go in and then come can come out the other side just like that and it can be done in a paragraph a rather long one and hmm. before the reader knows it they've went through a two-page paragraph and they'll appreciate that they'll admire you for that they'll, they'll love i love that when it happens to me because it's not forced so that's definitely uh, incipient in how you go about things so cultivate it my friend or i'll definitely yeah, I'll definitely think into that and audit that. Alrighty. I appreciate it, man. This has been a good chat. You too. Uh, please send me like the okay. audio file of this so I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I'll have to figure. This is my first time doing all that stuff, but I'll definitely figure it out. Thanks, man. Have a great day. Hey, you as well. Cheers. Aloha.